Hello everyone, my name is Jess and we are right here at Save the Bay's Exploration Center in Aquarium. Um, I am one of our educators here at Save the Bay um, and I just wanted to start off by wishing you all a very happy Earth Day. Um, I know it's a little bit of a weird time right now but if you have the ability um, you can put your head out a window, maybe explore your backyard, just get some fresh air and enjoy nature. Um, today we're going to be joining nature, uh, enjoying nature by learning a little bit more about these guys right here. Um, so these guys are called Northern Diamondback Terrapins, and you can see Phyllis, this large lady right here. She is so ready to meet you guys, and she wants to wish you a nice happy Earth Day as well. Um, but just looking at these turtles, um, so looking at these turtles, can tell that they like to live in water so we call them aquatic turtles but there's something unique about them so these turtles aren't quite sea turtles that live in that open ocean um, they are also not quite freshwater turtles that live in ponds streams and lakes but they're very unique they live in brackish water or estuaries so brackish water is that mixture of fresh and salt water that meets and combines and it's actually what is in Narragansett Bay so for those of you who are just joining us, my name is Jess and behind the camera there we have Adam. Um, and today we are learning all about Diamondback Terrapins. So what I was talking about initially with these guys is they like to live in brackish water. So that mixture of salt and fresh water. Um, so uh, that makes them very unique. They're actually the only species of turtle in the entire U.S. that actually live in that brackish water. Um, so of course Narragansett Bay is made of that brackish water so you think these would be the perfect habitat um, for these guys to live but um, in Rhode Island unfortunately these guys are actually endangered. We're the only state that has classified these guys as endangered and that's due to a lot of different factors. So the biggest main factor of why they're endangered has to do with their habitat. So these guys live in salt marshes um, and so people have been building upon the salt marshes or in their nesting site and things like that um, as well as sea level rise is actually drowning our salt marshes um, so that's a really big reason why they're endangered here in Rhode Island um, but there's some other reasons too um, so these guys when they're hatchlings when they're eggs um, the females will lay them on land and that's when predators like to strike so things like raccoons opossums foxes um, they'll actually come in, dig up that nest, and eat those yummy eggs. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I enjoy a good egg in the morning. So do those predators, um, but not so great for our diamondback terrapins. Um, also, another reason they're in decline is that a long time ago, about 200 years ago, these guys were actually considered to be a delicacy. Um, so they were actually eaten in turtle soup and they were shipped all across the world. Um, pretty crazy for their very valuable meat. Um, so what we're going to do today is first I want to kind of classify these animals. So if we turn our attention over here, um, I have our taxonomic breakdown of these guys. It kind of helps figure out which groups they're more similar to, which groups they might be more um, distantly related to. So we're going to start here at the kingdom, um, and that's the broadest category. And as we move down, it gets more and more specific. Um, until we get to our individual turtles that we're going to be learning about today. Um, so if we start here in our kingdom, um, they are in the Animalia kingdom. So that just means they're animals. So every single thing that you've met so far here with the Save the Bay Breakfast by the Bay videos are in the animal kingdom as well. And same with us as well too. Um, now we're getting a little bit more specific, a little bit more classified. We're moving into the phylum. Um, so the phylum is chordata, and that just means that they have um, a skeleton or backbone. Um, so like Adam likes to show us in a lot of his videos, um, if you feel those little bones sticking out in your back there, that is your spine. Um, so something that makes us similar um, to the diamondback terrapins as well. So, so far we're pretty similar, um, but we know that we are not the same as these turtles here. So we're going to start to see that differentiation in just a little bit. Um, so next we're moving down to the class a little bit more specific here and we're in the reptilia class. Um, so this, as the name kind of hints, it's reptiles, so things like alligators, crocodiles, snakes, 
and even our turtles. So things that tend to be a little bit more cold-blooded and things that lay eggs as well. Very different from us. So that's where we start to see the differentiation. Um, next, we're moving into order, and this is where my Latin starts to fail me. Um, so forgive me for my <laughs> improper pronunciation. Um, so we have testundies. Um, so that includes things like turtles, terrapins, and tortoises. Um, so that's including the freshwater species, the terrestrial things that live on land, as well as our brackish water and freshwater turtles. So very big, large, encompassing. Um, and here's where they start to differentiate between those sea turtles or ocean turtles. So our family, a mine today, um, that just means streamlined shells. So you're looking more at the pond turtles um, and freshwater turtles, but with every rule, there's always an exception. Um, so there is a species of terrestrial turtle called box turtles that are also in this family too. Um, cool to know. And then I'm gonna kind of lump the genus and species together because our diamondback terrapins are actually really special. And they are the only species in this genus. This genus is Malachlemys, which means soft tortoise. And terrapin translates to turtle. So a soft tortoise turtle. Kind of weird description of these guys, um, but we learned that that's kind of how it goes in the Latin description. Yeah. So we have a question from Matthew. Is there a difference between a turtle and a tortoise? It's a, that's a really great question, Matthew, and it's a little bit dicey as far as figuring out the differentiation. Um, so I like to think of turtles as, as the overarching kind of big family. Um, some people look at turtles as just aquatic, um, but tortoises, for sure, you're not going to find a tortoise in the water. So that's definitely a terrestrial-based or land-based um, turtle. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, it's a little dicey, though, with the um, trying to figure that stuff out. Beautiful, so I hope that kind of gave you um, all at home just a little bit of an easier way to kind of see where they're related to our oceanic um, saltwater turtles as well as those freshwater turtles. Um, so now moving back over here to our diamondback terrapins, I would love to introduce you to these guys. Um, and something too I forgot to mention is these guys, as I was saying, they're endangered in Rhode Island, but one reason why they're also endangered is because people like to take these guys out of the wild as pets. Um, so the only reason we have these diamondback terrapins here at our exploration center is because actually two of these guys were taken from the wild as pets and one of them had to be taken out of the wild because it wasn't going to be able to survive. Um, some people see these turtles and think they're so cute. I agree, I think they're adorable. Um, but they're really hard to take care of. They live for about 25 to 40 years. Most people don't know that when they're taking them and raising them as pets. And they live in that brackish water, the salt and fresh water. So it's very hard to maintain that at home. And plus these guys have a very specialized diet too. Um, so just all around, not a good idea to have these guys as pets. Um, but I would love to introduce you to our first one and our largest one, if she'll come over for me. Let me hand sanitize my hands first. <laughs> Alrighty, so if she'll come out of the water for us. Oh, Jerry looks like he's going to say hi. Um, something I did want to mention about these turtles, um, if any of you, like our Aquarius Adam, our Grateful Dead fans, um, you'll notice that their names kind of sound familiar. So we have Phyllis, Jerry, and Bob Weir in here. Chris wants to know, do the terrapins get very big like sea turtles? Oh, so they do not get as large. I'll show you if Phyllis wants to come over. Sometimes if she thinks your fingers are food, she's definitely all for it. There she is. Alrighty, so this is just about as large as terrapins get. Um, so Phyllis is a large female diamondback terrapin. Um, and the reason they get their name, if you take a look, um, so each one of these individual sections on her shell is her scoots, and they have a very beautiful diamond-shaped pattern. It's a little easier to tell when they're dry, but hopefully you guys are seeing a little bit of that here and now. Um, so Phyllis was taken out of the wild and she was raised as a pet. So we have her here at our exploration center and aquarium. You can see she's got these very powerful back legs. Um, and females, the reason they get a little bit larger is because they're the ones who actually go out of the water to lay their eggs. Um, so they can travel far distances in which to do so. And you can see she's got these powerful webbed feet as well to help her swim. She's doing some good kicking for us here and now, um, but also to help her bury her eggs when she does lay them. 
so pretty cool, pretty interesting. Um, so Phyllis, we think she's about eight years old, um, but it's hard to tell. We don't know exactly when um, she was taken from the wild, but she's a full-grown female. Um, besides size, females do get about 50% bigger than males. Um, you can also tell what, by their tails. Females have a little bit shorter and stubbier and thinner, actually, uh, tails than our males do. Um, so females will travel very far distances to find the perfect land to lay their eggs. Um, typically they like sandy bottomed areas um, and sometimes even they'll travel across roads um, so people will see them then and even in some weird cases um, they've been known to delay flights because they've actually been traveling across um, runways of airports. Um, so pretty interesting. Beautiful. So I'm gonna pull out one of our males so you can kind of see some of the difference. And Phyllis looks like she's ready to run. Um, but thank you, Phyllis, for giving us your time. And we can watch her go back into the water. Or maybe not. Maybe she just wants more camera time. I don't blame her. <laughs> Woo. All righty, let's see if I can pull Jerry out. Phyllis thinks I have food. Like I told you, she's very interested in food less so um, in our other male terrapins in here. Here's Jerry. So Jerry, you can see he's much, much smaller than Phyllis, um, and he's actually a full-grown male. Um, but the special thing about Jerry is if you guys actually tuned into our video two weeks ago, um, you heard me talking about mutations. So if you look right at his face here, he was the one who was taken from the wild um, and because he was missing that upper beak. So he wasn't injured as a juvenile, but more so he was born like that. And the reason that's not so good is these guys in the wild eat things like fish, um, periwinkle snails, things with hard shells that are um, really hard to crunch into. And so Jerry, since he doesn't have those two um, jaws to really um, crush into something, um, we have to hand feed him and cut him small pieces of food so he wouldn't have been able to survive on his own. Uh, then also too, if you look at Jerry's face, um, you can see there is a hole right in that middle where that upper jaw or beak should be. And so that's actually his nasal passage. Um, because that nasal passage is exposed, he's very susceptible um, to infections and diseases and things like that. So really good thing that we have him here. Beautiful, all righty. Um, and you can see he has those beautiful webbed feet. And like I was saying, males have those longer, thicker tails too. Kind of helps tell the difference between the two. But overall, pretty hard species to tell the difference between males and females until they are full grown adults. Beautiful. I'm gonna put this guy back. And then I won't grab Bob We are out, but I will point him in your direction. Um, so this is Bob, he's our newest member here. Um, and so this guy actually came to us, same thing, he was raised as a pet. Um, he was actually living in freshwater for a while, so not super great. Um, so he's been with us for a little under a year, and he's already started to trim down a little bit, working on his summer body over here. Um, and you can see it, that his shell is getting a little bit healthier too as well. So we're very excited to have him here. Um, and you guys might have noticed over on this side of the exhibit, um, there is a lovely sandy enclosure. So the reason we have this is because we have a big, large female terrapin and two males. Um, so we're hopeful to try to contribute to some of that population um, in the form of hatchlings. So we're hoping that Phyllis will lay some eggs and really exciting news is she actually did. So it's very fragile, so I won't pick it up. Um, but earlier, a couple weeks ago, we actually discovered an egg in their exhibit. So this is the first time we've seen something like that. So really, really exciting news. It means Phyllis is on her way, um, but we're hopeful that she'll start to lay eggs here and then we can reintroduce them back into the wild. Um, so I know I've talked a lot about how these guys are endangered here in Rhode Island, but I also want to focus on some of the really good things that are happening here too. So there is a point in time in Rhode Island where diamondback terrapins weren't seen for about 20 years. Um, they were almost extinct, which is pretty wild. Um, but then what happened somewhere in Barrington, um, they actually started to see a couple terrapins here and there. 
And then what the citizens decided to do in Barrington is to help protect and preserve these guys. Much like Save the Bay, how we started with a group of local concerned citizens, same thing happened in Barrington. It was a group of local concerned citizens. They wanted to protect the terrapins. So the first thing, the first action that they did is they created a wildlife refuge um, where these guys live and also where they nest. Because uh, like I was saying before, a big part of the reason that these guys are not reproducing and their offspring aren't getting to be adults um, is because their nesting grounds are being built upon. Uh, so homes are being put there, local stores, things like that. Um, so they don't have that area and they're having to travel farther and farther to find a good area. So um, those citizens in Barrington made it a wildlife refuge. And then what they do year after year um, since they've done that is they go out, they look for nesting sites laid by females and they actually protect them. Because like I was saying before too, um, a big source of reason why these guys are endangered in Rhode Island is because um, predators love to eat their tasty eggs. Um, so they actually put a covering over the nest so that foxes, um, raccoons and things like that can't eat the juveniles. Um, and then what they do is once those hatchlings are ready to come out, they actually dig up the hatchlings and they move them to a safer location so that they aren't exposed on their way to safety. Um, so since they've done that, that population went from about zero to over 500. So they're doing really, really amazing work. And even exciting news, in North Kingstown, um, we're starting to see larger numbers of terrapins hanging out there too. So these guys could be coming back in Rhode Island, and even though they're endangered because of human-based actions, their populations are also increasing because of what local concerned citizens are doing. Um, so in the spirit of Earth Day, I figured I'd talk about this topic um, because it's really great to see what you can do, what I can do, and what we together as a community can do um, to help protect these guys too in their natural habitats as well. So lots of really exciting things that we can do today. Um, Adam, do we have any more questions about these guys before I move on? Uh, you've answered most of them. Oh, awesome. Yeah, doing great. Beautiful. All right, guys. Um, well, I did want to say Happy Earth Day once again. Um, also, too, I know I talked a lot about um, Barrington and their Diamondback Terrapins. In the link below, you'll see some great information if you are interested in learning more about what they're doing in Barrington and maybe how you can help in your community, too. Um, there is that link below. And then, as always, if you like what Save the Bay is doing um, to protect these guys, um, not only are we working on their nesting enclosure here, uh, but we go and we restore the salt marshes out in our bay as well. Um, if you like those efforts that we are doing um, in our bay and you want to support us, there is a link below in which you can donate and things like that if you have the means. Um, but enjoy this beautiful day and hopefully you guys get to go outside in whatever capacity you can um, or even just feel that sunshine on your face um, and thank the earth for another happy earth day. Um, thank you guys so much and we'll see you right here at uh, the Exploration Center tomorrow to learn a little bit more about hermit crabs. Bye guys.